just takes it a second here. It's all right. Didn't want the thing that had all my notes anyway. Maybe I shouldn't mess with it. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 23rd of the COVID calls. This is a daily discussion of the COVID-19 pandemic with a diverse collection of disaster experts. These calls are held every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern time, except for today when we started 10 minutes late because Zoom apparently wanted us to. But here we are. My name is Scott Knowles. I'm a historian of disasters at Drexel University in Philadelphia, and I serve as the host for these discussions. We are streaming on YouTube Live. The link to this discussion can be found at the Scott Knowles YouTube channel, or you can email me or find me on Twitter at US of Disaster. Please do help spread the word and send suggestions for guests and topics, and please feel free to suggest yourself as a future guest. You can also hear the COVID calls recorded as podcasts. Just go to soundcloud.com and search for the Slow Disaster Podcast. I hope you will join us tomorrow and Friday for a two-day exploration of COVID-19 in Louisiana. Tomorrow, I will discuss COVID-19 in Cancer Alley with Joy Banner from the Whitney Plantation, Ashley Rogers, also from Whitney Plantation, and Sophie Kasakov from Vice Magazine. As of today, there are 2,023,663 globally confirmed cases of COVID-19, according to Johns Hopkins University Coronavirus Resource Center. That's up from 1,978,769 cases yesterday. 614,482 of those are in the United States, up from 598,670 yesterday. There are now reported a total of 27,085 deaths in the United States, up from 25,239 yesterday. The difference in the death totals from yesterday to today in the United States is 1,846. That number stood out to me, perhaps to you as well. I, I knew that number somehow and I looked it up and there it was. The recorded number of deaths in Hurricane Katrina was 1,836. That's 10 fewer than the COVID-19 toll from yesterday in the US. Why is my mind full of these numbers? Well, in part because I study disasters and disasters have for a long time and certainly since we've entered the era of the modern state been recorded in death tallies and dollar counts. With COVID-19, the performance of the Dow Jones Industrial Average has also emerged as a, a key number the media and the president have latched onto to somehow combine and understand the death total and the sort of broader impact of the disaster. But if one takes even a cursory look behind the numbers, we find the errors in our counting, arbitrary time frames drawn around the period of counting, the innumerable problems of comorbidities, what is it that actually killed a person? And the new issue we seem to be facing with COVID-19, people being clinically diagnosed in some countries like South Korea, Singapore, allowing perhaps a more accurate picture of the disaster versus countries like the United States where the counting is proceeding in fits and starts unevenly across the nation. As I've come to say as a shorthand, the count is never the real count. That isn't a new problem. One of the darkest moments in Stanley Kubrick's Cold War masterpiece, Dr. Strangelove, is the impassioned speech that George C. Scott as General Buck Turgidson makes for a full out atomic attack against the Soviet Union, predicting to the president in his speech acceptable losses for the United States, 10 to 20 million killed tops. The optimism of General Turgidson, the dark humor and the genius of the film, the rationality of it has reminded me of this wild to and fro of predictions in the US from a somehow acceptable 60,000 deaths from COVID-19 to a less acceptable 100,000 to a cataclysmic 2 million deaths. We've heard all of these projections in the last month. What realities exist between those numbers? I started to think we should move past such measures to begin thinking maybe about trauma or maybe fear. The Cold War certainly racked up huge totals in fear or maybe we should turn it inside out and perhaps even come up with a measurement of care. How much care is generated and expended around a disaster, around COVID-19? How do we think about risk? What's acceptable, what isn't? 
How do we drag what we learn from one era of disasters into another and who's making those decisions anyway? I wanted to talk with an expert on these issues. And so that's why I invited Lee Clark to come on COVID calls and talk with me today. Let me introduce him. Lee is a sociology professor at Rutgers University, an elected fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He's the author of some extraordinary books, including Acceptable Risk, Making Decisions in a Toxic Environment, Worst Cases, Terror and Catastrophe in the Popular Imagination, and Mission Improbable, Using Fantasy Documents to Tame Disaster. He's also co-author of a really crucial article that I've discussed with some of you even on, on COVID calls, Karen Chess, titled Elites and Panic, More to Fear Than Fear Itself. Lee is what I call a disaster polymath, and I'm really glad he could join me today on COVID calls. Uh, Lee Clark, thank you for being here. Thanks for inviting me, Scott. I'm sorry to be here. <laughs> I, I take that. I totally understand where you're coming from with that. Um, I want to invite everyone to ask questions in the YouTube live chat, or you can tweet your questions and tag me when you do at US of Disaster. So Lee, I've been asking everyone um, really just to start with an update from home because that's where we are unless we're providing medical care. So how are things where you are? Well, I'm in central New Jersey in the, in the beautiful town of Metuchen. It looks like a sunny spring day out there. It might be warm. I haven't been outside yet, so, uh, but I will go outside. Uh, I think the, the the admonition that people should not should stay inside is is more apt for people in urban environments where just to go out of their house you know, entails being around other people. Fortunately, I can go in my backyard and, and just be outside for a few minutes and that will be good. But uh, you know, the, the county that, I, that my town is in, Edison, uh, Middlesex County is uh, the second, has the second highest body count in, in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And um, um, I, I, didn't, I didn't look up, I should have looked up the numbers, um, but like you say, it's, uh, it's traumatic no matter what it is. So it's, um, I, I have been outside, I have driven, driven to this place or that, and it's a ghost town and so the social cost I mean, it's kind of nice not having so many cars on the road, but in another way, it's not nice. It's an indication that, um, that economic activity is not happening, and more broadly, social activity is not, is not happening, and you know, we'd like to be around other people, and, and we're not. Uh, I'm fortunate that I have an adult living in my house, and to soon-to-be adults, and they're interesting people. Um, I can't imagine how terrible it would be if I were stuck in a small apartment in uh, Philadelphia, New York, Los Angeles, whatever. It would be worse. Worst cases can always be worse. How do you account for that uh, high total in Middlesex County versus other counties in New Jersey? Is there a big medical center there or, or retirement centers or, or do you even know? Well, both, but we're, we're very, I mean, we're essentially a suburb of New York City. Uh, Bergen County, I think it's the one that, it's, that's right over the bridge in, in Northern Jersey that has the high, highest, um, highest body count and they are really a suburb of New York. So there were, lot, there were a lot of people traveling here and there and a lot of people on the uh, what a month, five weeks ago were, were on the train mm -hmm. uh, to New York and back. Right. I'm not blaming it on New York. It's just there, it's a high, high density population that's, that's close to the epicenter of the, of the circle as it were. I have a lot of topics I want to get to you, uh, get to with you today, Lee. But I, I actually want to ask you a question I've never asked you, which is, um, how did you get first interested in in risk organization? Well, by accident, of course. Every time I ask this question, I asked it tw <laughs> twice yesterday. Both of my guests said by accident, but could you but that's me? probably true for most of us yeah. in whatever we study. Uh, I had I was a graduate student at uh, Stony Brook. So then it was State University of New York at Stony Brook, now it's Stony Brook University. 
and had the great good fortune uh, of running across uh, Charles Perrault, the famous author of a number of books, but the, mo the one most relevant here is, uh, is, or two really. One of them is called Normal Accidents. That's probably the better known of the two most relevant things that he wrote. And the other is uh, The Next Catastrophe. And I think that's what it ended up being called. Um, sadly, we lost him uh, late last year. But anyway, I uh, took a class with him on, on a lark. I, somebody said, you should take a class from this guy. He's difficult but you'll learn a lot. And there began um, a relationship between mentor and student that ultimately transformed into one between friends. Although he, he'll he always be a voice in my, you know, a scholarly voice in my head uh, as long as I'm with us. <laughs> and um, so that, so it was, it was an accident in many ways. And then that was 1979, the same year of Three Mile Island. Mm -hmm. And the, his seminal work, Normal Accidents, came from, was intimately, I mean, it had its roots in that accident. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing led to another. Uh, and next thing you know, I was writing a dissertation that was connected to to um, connected to, to the Perot project. Um, and you were, so you were studying the disasters with him. keep coming at you. Yeah. And really my home field of scholarship is is sociology of organizations as mm -hmm. it was for for Perot. Um, and but the disasters kept coming at me and coming at me and coming at me. And so finally I just gave up the ghost and said, okay. Well, I'm going to do my organizational scholarship in the context of empirical materials about disaster. And, and here I am today. A lot of people may not know how many disaster researchers, and I use that term very broadly, but have that, that training in organizational sociology. I mean, going back into yeah, the Yeah, they 50s. used to. That's mm -hmm. they in sociology they, they used to. That's where uh, Russ Gines and Henry Corntelli who were really the, the the parents of disaster research in the social sciences. That's that that's where they saw their initial their that and what used to be called mass behavior or mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah. We don't use the term anymore. But that's what they—that's what they thought they were actually studying, and not not disaster per se. But the the field of disaster research has always been interdisciplinary: psychologists, historians, political scientists. Because disasters know no boundaries, and you have to dip into you have to dip into history if you want to understand the significance of. Um, what's what's the number 130,000 dead mm -hmm. from from this um, compared to what right and for that you need you need to look back and you need to look sideways so it's always been an interdisciplinary subfield and uh, uh, therein lies it's, it's great interest and in some ways it's it's um, it's it's a detriment as well, but that's a different story. So I want to think about worst cases a little bit here. Yeah. About COVID is a worst case, but I want to, I was going back and looking through some of your writings. And I actually want to, I want to give a brief quote here from, from an essay you wrote in um, 2005. And it says, this is the key to understanding Katrina as a worst case, the imagination Events that we call worst cases are beyond the imagination, overwhelming it with images, data, noise, disorder, and sometimes violence and despair. Since the disaster, I've been grappling with the social, political, and physical dimensions of Katrina, trying to figure out what I think about it all. It's stretching my imagination, and that's one way I know it really is a worst case. And that was part of a remarkable set of essays that were written after Hurricane Katrina, but you were applying ideas from your book, worst cases to that. Well, it was very early on before. Yeah, 
it was oh. the first week after the hurricane. That's why I thought it would be interesting to bring it back into this conversation. Thanks for that. Yes, um, we're and we're still early in this disaster, and so some things I don't. I'm not sure what I think just yet, but that's that's the nature of expertise. You have to be willing to 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 doubt and doubt and doubt others. But you want to go back to Katrina for the moment. It you was were, yeah yeah. I mean, it was a it was a worst case for the modern day. It turned out not to be. I mean, 1800. It was sad. It was tragic. That's uh, it was unacceptably high body count. But over 90 percent of New Orleans did evacuate. Um, there were important lessons to be learned, but many of them we already knew. Katrina had been, was one of the most predicted disasters in US history. And there had been, been even been a model, I mean, a simulation for it called mm -hmm. Hurricane Pam. Mm -hmm. um, we, knew what, we knew who was ready from important social science, science research down there. We knew about the levees. We knew about uh, the disappearance of the wetlands, which are said to attenuate storm surge. We just and and New Orleans has been has has had a target on its back for a long time. That said, there hadn't been as anything as large as Katrina since um, 1965. Was that um, yeah, Betsy Camille? I don't know. I I've forgotten the name. But yeah, you know, Betsy in '65. Betsy for yeah. for 40 years. Evacuation is expensive uh, and, and difficult to do, and it might not happen. You know, the storm might not come, and a lot of poor people. But but it was still a worst case because it violated our expectations for what for safety in the modern day, and it was not coincidental, which is not to say it was purposive. But it wasn't coincidental that a lot of the faces that we saw suffering were were, were black faces, and it was just um, it was it was an assault on civility on our expectations, and we just don't think that did, that many people should 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 be uh, should be at such risk in the modern day. That may be an unreasonable expectation to have, but that's a much that's not a technical question, ultimately, it's a political one, a moral one. When you took up the research for worst cases, what was the, what were the sort of core questions that you were asking at that, at that point? I mean, I know there's one distinction you make in the book between probabilistic thinking and what you call possibilistic yeah. thinking. Can you go a little bit more into the sort of kind of theoretical things that were on the table for you at that time, the cases I you were can, but it really came from the, I mean, it was, that was not accidental. It was a practical, a logical um, connection with my second book, Mission Improbable, which is all about organization and experts promising beyond their capabilities, creating best case scenarios. Right. So there are hints that makes it sound like a like a, a, a mystery novel, <laughs> but there are pieces, there are statements in Mission Improbable that uh, the, that the opposite of what I'm writing about there are worst case scenarios, and so it made sense. So there's something that was gnawing at me. Uh, how it is that we think about the supremely damaging or definitions of that in the, in the modern day, when in fact we are, as um, some scholars uh, dwell on, we are in many ways safer and live longer in, at least in richer countries uh, than, than, we've, than we've ever been. So that coincided with the long-term interest that I've had on in how it is that people come to the judgment that how, how it is that scholars come to the judgment that regular people are uh, irrational in a very narrow 
a technical way, this is true. And it, and it builds on a really important work in behavioral economics and psychology, where for the longest time, people running really clever experiments discovered that people make choices, not on the basis of the probabilities. And this goes against the modern definition of ra rational, what, what constitutes rational choice in individuals, which is, hey, let's, what is the likelihood that the plane is going to crash? Well, for modern commercial airliners, extremely low. You're much more likely, if you're going to go across the country, it's much safer to get on a, a, a big airliner than to drive across. Uh, drive across the country, um, yet people are afraid to fly. And, and so look how look how rational people are. Now the great importance of that work really was that it showed that, that the standard e economic models of how people decide that the models themselves are not that are right. not accurate. But economics has the enviable position of it's in the enviable position of being the only social science that I know of that if the, if the subjects don't act according to the theory, they conclude that there's something wrong with the subjects instead of the theory. <laughs> anyway, so. But, but those economists were, I mean, they're, they're and uh, that's totally, I'm sure I'm going <laughs> to hear it from the economists, so that's fine. Yeah, uh, well, I say it, I say it <laughs> in, in a provocative way. For yeah, least. but you're... Uh, these are issues so, you were taking up in Mission Improbable when you were looking at at actors there who were yeah 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 but but it, so it cascaded into or I, I developed it I, I think I developed it more or less successfully in worst cases where I'm trying to account for what looks like looks to me to be sensible action even in, even though it goes against what probability would tell us is the smart thing to do. Mm -hmm. So if you're middle class and you have little children and you're in, otherwise you're in good health, you're crazy. No, not crazy. Uh, sorry, that's the wrong word. You're irrational if you don't have life insurance. But what are the chances that you're gonna need that? Mm -hmm. They're very low. It's a, that's why they, one of the reasons insurance companies are willing to sell you life insurance policies. They know the odds are with them, with them, not with you and when you buy it. But if you, if, you, if you have a little children and you die, people will then judge you harshly and rightly so because you can, but probabilistically it doesn't make any sense. Right. Why do people, um, when, when there's a lot of turbulence in the sky, when you're 30,000 feet up, why do people get nervous? I do it. Yeah, me too. I get nervous too. And the, I think the answer is, if you get into a lot of trouble in 30,000 feet, there is no probability. Or probabilistically there is, but it's only zero or one. <laughs> you're right. going to die. Right. <laughs> it's not... <laughs> Uh, um, so there, so there are many. So there are many times we make choices that look probabilistically irrational. But when what we're doing is we're making the bet on the on on the grounds of consequences, the possibilities. This I call possibilistic thinking, and this can be a double-edged sword because I. I mean, it's too too often uh, people who haven't read the book, and this is a, all authors complain that they are not read enough. Uh, say that I'm I'm an alarmist, uh, that I've gone down the rabbit hole, but uh, it's not the case. I don't say abandon probabilistic thinking. I mean, that's why I put my my retirement money in safe places like. Market, right? <laughs> right. No, exactly. Of, yeah. Over time, I, I think the stock market will be the smarter place to have my retirement money. Uh, but I think there's a balance, and I think we, I, and I think 
it doesn't help anything to say people people are stupid and irrational. It doesn't help us understand why people make choices. Certainly that might help us understand policy. Certainly irrationality does happen. Certainly stupidity happens, accidents, chicanery, all kinds of that. All that stuff is, is human. Uh, all that stuff happens, but in understanding choice, I was trying to find a different rubric, as we mm -hmm. say now. Why so, people do what they do. So as the pandemic has been uh, playing out in these last few months, then this this must have been on your your mind a lot, particularly as we've watched country by country make a set yep. of decisions, and then in the United States, state yep. by state, household by household. Um, and uh, yes, very much it's been on my mind, uh, obviously, and I don't think that it's that it's useful to come to the conclusion that people have been foolish or that governors have been foolish in shutting things down as the metaphor goes now. I don't, it, it, we don't expect that, I mean, we don't expect 100,000 people to die from a virus we didn't see coming. Well, we did see it coming and we should have been prepared for it. There's no reason in the world that we should have been better prepared for this. This was not a, at best, this was a bolt from the gray. It certainly wasn't a bolt from the blue. Um, um, we could get into or, uh, failures of imagination and organization if, if there's time. Um, it was, it's been kind of surprising to me that people have acted on, that officials have acted on these worst case scenario, these worst case possibilities. Um, because the cost has, and I'm not just talking about economic costs, the, 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 the trauma that you referred to is very important, not just at the individual level. I mean, I, I'm, I'm sad and I, I go to class with my students and there's widespread depression. And I think that's gonna be an important thing throughout society, but there's also something that uh, sociologists were first to identify, especially with the seminal work of Kai Erickson, uh, community level, tra community trauma. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very difficult to count. Uh, and to enumerate in the usual in the usual ways, but it, that doesn't make it any less real. Um, and we see it in in certain kinds of disasters and in certain kinds kinds of responses. So there were there were a lot of incentives not to act on the worst case projections, but Fauci very very. I knew, knew the, the technical ins and outs of, the, of these things. He was there and thank goodness that he was. You know? uh, on the other hand, I do understand when people, some people say we overreacted. I mean, the, the models were wrong by a lot, not a little bit. We expect a little bit, but a whole lot. There's a big difference between what well, today it's 133,000 dead and that'll continue to go up, but it doesn't look like it's going to be anywhere close to a quarter of a million, let alone two million. Um, so there was a time that that would be just considered the cost of doing business. Katrina, to go back to hurricanes, Katrina wasn't by, you know, by any means the largest didn't create the, the, the largest body count in the United States. That was in 1900 in Galveston, Texas. Right, and right. the official number is 8,000 dead, 8,000. Yeah. Yeah. And it was probably higher than that because as you pointed out, the body counts are always inaccurate with one exception, modern airplanes. We always know exactly how many people That's died. Right. Because there's a manifest. We still don't know exactly how many people died on the on the Titanic because they sold tickets on the boat. Right, right. 
<laughs> yeah. but a, a major commercial airline goes down the no. number exactly yeah so were you um, were you you've been surprised then that the the worst case seems to have become adopted into the 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 protocol i mean trump was late to get there other countries were very early to get there i think right right um, right uh, uh trump's response which is not which is feasible because lives could have been could, could have been saved but they're lost to that i mean we could have we could have tires on, on all cars that never never blew out but and we have them now they're called run flat tires and they cost four or five hundred dollars a piece so that's a lot of money for for people so there's a cost to these things um i yes i'm surprised and in some way i was surprised that so many officials did go on on not the bandwagon did go with the worst case so many incentives not to uh and in some ways you could judge what we've seen as what uh, Karen Chess and I call elite panic, um, which is something we saw in, a, in, you remember the anthrax attacks right after 9-11? Yeah, absolutely, sure. Well, uh, how many, I don't know, it's, it's a very small number of people died, but a huge event on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. Not in most people see be anthracis all the time. They know exactly how to deal with it. I was on some committee where people, you know, some older fellows used to work for US AMRID when we used to have an acknowledged bio. -wide. They would have the anthracis spills all the time. They know exactly, they weren't freaked out about it. Mm -hmm. But we were, and, and officials were, and they dealt things or claimed that they did. Out in New Jersey, certainly we had we had mailings here. Yeah. And people I remember seeing neighbors outside cleaning their mail with with, with bleach. Um, but out of the fear that was engendered by elites who were who were saying, you know, this the who knows how bad this could get? Karen and I couldn't call for that, especially with doctors who are calling up their other friends asking smallpox vaccinations, which had nothing to do with B. anthracis. And we haven't had it was eradicated. <laughs> there isn't there is a smallpox vaccination to have. <laughs> um, so overreaction on the part on the parts of elites is arguably my overreact. Um, well, actually, Karen and I were more specific than that. We said it was that elite panic is a breakdown of social order. Uh, the social social bonds, especially institutional trust, where people no longer um, know who to look for or think they, they they're not sure who to trust. And in the present case, you look at when when I see stories of people trusting Donald Trump for medical advice over what real the medical doctors say that doesn't. That's a, that's a, that's an indicator of elite panic. Um, I, so. I wanted to because I wanted to ask you about about that and 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 how you think about expertise in this moment because it yeah. seems that one of the things that's really a sort of constant battle not just in the scientific space, but in the cultural space right now in the United States is um, who the elite actually is. And I suppose there's a, there's a strain of that that goes way back in American history 
uh, around uh, the sort of populism versus versus yeah. elitism. Yeah. But you know, we have a case right now where the, the sort of a ruling class in America that has campaigned and won elections on the idea that science should be discredited. And we maybe we miss that I miss the part that, that they that, wanted on the idea that science should be discredited. That sci uh, scientists cannot be trusted. And right. now we seem to be reaping that whirlwind a little bit here, you know, and there's a lot of confusion about who the elites actually are. Uh, you know, um, I'm tempted to say, well, there's a, a vast right wing conspiracy. Uh, I, I'm a big believer in science. I think for scientific questions, we have to there, there's no better place to look for for the answers. Is the Earth flat? We, you know, uh, how to how to uh, epidemiological dynamics work? It's better that we go with somebody who has training and knowledge in those things. So when I say elite, I don't mean that. There's, I, I think of it as it's a relational concept, and it varies by the by the situation, somebody can in a, in a, say a scientific elite, but in another context, say, so Fauci doesn't really make policy. So he's not really a member of the policy elite. He's advising them. And that may be how it should, how it should be, but he's certainly in, in um, cause he knows more things. Uh, about, but he's clear one one thing that differentiates that sets real experts off from again in a particular you know domain of knowledge is that they know the limits of what they of of their knowledge, and they're willing to say mm, that's outside my. Uh, the journalist calls me up and says, we want, we want to talk about the psychology of, of, I don't know, dissociative behavior. I'm like, I don't, that's not my, I don't know anything about that. Yeah. Whereas the other people who are not experts will claim that their gut will tell them the, the right way to be in, in a military situation. Uh, I may disagree with the generals and the colonels and the, and the admirals, but they're expertise is second to none when it comes to military stuff. Right. If I have a brain tumor, I'm not going with anybody's gut. I'm going to go to a neurologist. <laughs> right. Yeah. The, um, yeah. This, this, um, well, I want to, uh, let me put a pin in that. I want to come back to something else um, here that we touched on just briefly for a second, which was around plans and models. And, you know, we've been awash in um, you mentioned the Hurricane Pam exercise. Yeah. You know, and there's the Crimson Contagion exercise that apparently was done uh, around a pandemic. Um, you know, in your work, you spend a lot of time looking at disaster plans and disaster. I'm real, I'm real popular at parties. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, okay, well, you're in the right party right now, let me tell you, because <laughs> it, it, there's two people who can talk about this, it's you and me, but I, but I wanna, so I wanna start in the present, but I, I'd like to use this as a way also to sort of think about what you've learned over time, looking at disaster plans and models. Do you see anything different right now in the way that those plans and models actually play out in the midst of a disaster? Or are we just replaying we sort play. of old fantasy documents laying on the shelf? They don't have any connection with reality. That's your term, fantasy documents. I mean, it is. Uh, I mean, we'll, we'll, the, somewhere on a shelf, there will be this precise, more or less, this precise scenario that's been um, that, that's been studied, even simulated now, and and somebody will come along, they'll discover that it look has been right right under our nose all the time. Why did you ignore it? Um, and the, and there, but there, in, in the sea of those kinds of plans and scenarios, 
there are others that are completely wrong. So I, the plans don't, they don't really do much other than, I mean, Karen and I, when we were looking at the anthrax, the response at the local level of the anthrax attacks, looked into the planning and what, it, what they were useful for, planning and simulations and what they were useful for was putting people in touch with 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 each other because mm. that's what that's what needs to happen when um, when things go awry you know somebody somebody from i don't know the local the county courthouse needs to talk to somebody in the hospital well you don't just call up the switchboard you call dr smith and find out what what she's what she is experiencing, and you trust her judgment more than Dr. Jones because you know that Dr. Jones is a hothead. <laughs> no matter what their their their, their right. formal titles are, right? I don't know. I I haven't seen specific plans for for COVID, um, uh, but uh, but I, I it's hard to predict. There'll be there'll be commissions. There'll be academic conferences. Uh, at the, uh, the commissions will do the investigation and they will find that there's been a lack of coordination and cooperation and, um, and that there was a lot more chaos. There'll be a lot of people who keep repeating this idea that nobody ever saw this coming. And then there'll be those of us on the other side saying this is this easy to see as the as full, the next next full tide and was was foreseen and i think the evidence will be on our, on on that side and i think that the next time it could well be 250,000 or 2 million it will happen again it will happen again and it will jolt our expectations and it will cause uh, and it will cause trauma, and they said, um, well, they said in, at the time, well, SARS was two thousand two, four, yeah, two, and people treated it as the worst case. They said everybody's overreacting, but they contained it. That was a pretty serious had had the potential to be be a very serious event. And it was serious, but I mean, much more could have wrought much, much greater damage than it did. There's um, something a little bit um, unnerving, though, in the way you're talking about the plans and then the commissions, almost, yeah. almost as if they're, they're perform, they're a form of socialization, maybe on their best day, but on their worst day, their performance, they don't. Um, they on, their worst day, they, on their worst day, they are performance art, and they are used to um, uh, as political cover for one position or another. On their worst day, well, I mean, I go back to the nuclear, you know, the civil defense nuclear plans were never based in reality. How could they have been? Um, but if you could plan for it, and they planned, they said they, being defenders of from the 1950s through the 1970s, mm -hmm. they said we have a plan for surviving uh, a nuclear war. Well, if you have a plan for it, oh, it's going to be terrible, millions and millions of deaths, but our country will still be here. No, there will be no place to come home to. But it makes it like the, the the uncontrollable is controllable, and that's a that's a very frightening uh, prospect indeed to me. But, but that was just to have a little more context around that. You you think that's because again the elites at that time the civil defense elites they felt like they needed to reassure each other that there yeah. would be a continuity of their of their role? I mean, is that, was that the, the way that was? Because those plans no. were not public. The public were, was not aware of most of no, those. sure. Well, they might not have been, I mean, they, may, they might not have been aware of specific, specific 
targeting maps and plans, although we can see them now, and they look remarkably like the, the plan, I mean, the remarkably like the, the, the maps with the red dots uh, over Orlando, the Northeastern Corridor, Washington. The COVID maps look like nuclear, nuclear targeting maps. <laughs> but uh, they need, need they, but there were a lot of things that were public. There were the, the duck and cover exercises. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. There, was, there were the, the, the push on the parts of uh, de civil defense organizations that gave birth to FEMA, the, the DCPA, defense, mm -hmm. I forgot. Maybe you maybe you remember. I only remember um, the acronym. The, ah, yeah, just yeah. the acronym. Right? It was defense a real civil protection. real, real defense, nerds. We just sit around civil talk protection. About. Yeah, DC Defense uh, Civil Protection Administration. I think they they were urging some cities to spend money on on civil defense. Right, uh, people build building shelters in their basement. Now, most most people didn't didn't buy it. Most people. Yeah. And most counties and most mayors said, uh, "Are you kidding me? If a, new, if a couple of nuclear warheads come over here and land on top of us, we're all smoked. <laughs> we're not spending money on this. Right. There's not going to be anybody left." Yeah. Uh, but they had to pretend that they could control. If here's the thing, uh, back it's such a wild case. If they had, if the if the civil def, real civil defenders at the time had had said what I think they knew to be true, that there was good, that nobody could win a nuclear war. Right. Then it leads to serious questions about their mental health. Right. <laughs> and it, if, if, if all of my actions are, are futile, why do I keep doing the same thing over and over? This is the definition of Insanity. Uh, so it wasn't just a least uh, trying to convince each other. Uh, I, I'm I'm put in the mind of a, a, a link to a conference after the Exxon Valdez oil spill, mm. uh, which is gave birth to this idea of, of fantasy documents because they there were there were all these plans for responding to major oil spills that were wildly out of touch with reality that I read on doing the research for about so long ago. Uh, anyway, I was at this, uh, at, at this conference in Louisiana and I gave a talk, an early talk about fantasy documents and these, these symbolic plans about, and but it was a room full of, regulators and yeah. people from the oil industry because that that's a pretty big industry in Louisiana and when I got finished with my talk you could have heard a pen drop yeah. <laughs> it was yeah. like it was like I had just proposed that everybody pull out their children's teeth with a with, with a pair of pliers but do you think that was that was because they didn't that they didn't like the fact that you'd caught on to the mm -hmm. Right. the secret right. codes and hand gestures that they'd been sharing around their industry that they really didn't know what was going on? Or do you think they exactly. thought, oh man, no, this no, guy's no. onto something. I ripped the clothes off the cane. Yeah. And, and I left as soon as I could. Uh, and uh, as I was waiting for the cab outside the convention center, wherever that was, um, and somebody in a suit sidled up next to me and said, it was like a, 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 it was like a movie. He said, uh, "Sotto voce, you know, I don't know if what you said in there is exactly right, but we kind of have to, kind of have to think that what we're doing is productive, something like, that. Yeah. pretty close to that." They knew that I mean, once a bunch of oil gets out into the open ocean, there, there's really nothing much you can, in fact, the, the cleanup efforts often do as much or more damage than, than the oil itself. And this is still true, but to that out loud, 
is to say part of the risk of oil production of a high consumptive consum high consumption carbon based burning based economy is occasionally we're going to have a whole bunch of oil contaminate places we don't want contaminated mm -hmm. product to say that one of the fantasy documents yeah. the other way they're comforting one of the things you mentioned charles perot earlier one of the things that he wrote um about fukushima it was things he was working on towards a very he was retired and still writing yeah yeah oh. i guess he never really retired uh, but oh. but he I'll never forget this. It's in an essay in the a bulletin of the atomic scientists. And he said towards the end of the essay, you know, just to what you're talking about here, that um, the fundamental questions really never get asked. I mean, that's the gist of what he was saying. He said, if you ask the real question, the real question is, are you willing to turn the machine off after you do your study? And, and it, that's what you're, I mean, this seems to be the kind of thing, you know, the bigger picture of a lot of this sort of fantasy yeah. documents and it, um, you know, elites doing this kind of planning is the fundamental questions somehow don't get asked, or if they do get asked, they're not, they're asked in a quiet room and then they're kind of filed away. Is, I mean, yeah. well, people have written about what's called forbidden knowledge, questions we, that make everybody uncomfortable when you just ask the question, um, let alone answer them forthrightly. Um, and straight up, and then, I mean, ultimately, that's what uh, that's what I advocate. Not that people or society be organized according to any principles I I believe in. I'm not I'm not as arrogant as that to, that I would have the answers. But I have pretty I'm pretty confident that democratic processes, open open and transparent processes, are pretty much the only way we can allocate risk in a fair way. Is there a forbidden question about COVID-19? Yeah, sure. Uh, why, why is it that we, that the, um, that the wet markets where this thing and SARS and, the, and others, I think, um, what, why are these, aspects of traditional society tolerated where live animals are slaughtered in public and mixed with uh, other bits and pieces of blood and, and then people eat bats. I mean, it's um, old world. Mm -hmm. It's an old world existence and to, to, and to call it into question is to, is to say, you think somebody else's culture is wrong. We don't say that these days. That's politically incorrect. And it's not to assign blame in only one place. I mean, there are other contributing, important contributing factors. There's a big reason that it's, there are more people who are, uh, there are greater suffering in New York and, and New Jersey than in, the, I guess, I haven't seen the map of Montana and Wyoming, but the red dots won't, will not be very big because they're not that many people. And they're not very densely populated. It's not a very densely populated place. Um, I want to remind. If, I mean, I'm sure there are other questions. I'm just not clever enough to figure them out. Yeah, yeah. That, I, I want to remind people that I'm talking with Lee Clark on COVID calls, and uh, we have about 10 minutes left. We got a little bit of a late start today. I hope you can spare 10 more sure. minutes. Okay, and please do get your questions in on Twitter or on YouTube live chat. And um, Leah, you mentioned this a couple of times and I wanna come back to it. The, you mentioned the red, the red circle, the red dot, and the, this has been on my mind a lot, the visualization yeah. of this particular disaster and of course it ties into a lot of things you've been thinking about in in models and fantasy documents and the way that that risk is communicated the way it's conceptualized the graphic mm -hmm. aspect of that is crucial is the red 
circle a good way to visualize this pandemic? I don't like it. I don't like it. They put it, partly because it, they, the, as I said, they look so much like the nuclear targeting yeah. maps or the, 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 they're not targeting maps. They're really, um, you know, maps from the late seventies of, of um, st nuclear strike maps. Right, the blast. Uh, the yeah, blast, blast. Well, and it, fallout too. I, mean, I guess you can look at kinds, yeah. Look at, at some of those some of those maps, and they have nice, neat, defined circles, mm -hmm. and as if nuclear weapon, thermonuclear warhead, lay inside those lines. Right. And then, if you look at a fall at a fallout map, the whole thing just kind of smears from east to west, and yeah. all, almost yeah. all the United States turns right. out to be you know, black and a black and white, <laughs> black and white map. And that's more accurate because it shows more where the damage is going to be. Mm -hmm. So uh, imagery is, is very important. I think that um, we look for their iconic, iconic images that we use to help, to, to help make sense and, and, and call up again the, uh, events and that helps us you know work these things disaster these terrible things into into culture i mean that's what we do we try not to just forget we will never forget that's what they said after 9 11. Mm -hmm. um, but for i think a lot a lot of people and now that's so long ago <laughs> You want to feel old? 9/11. Our students don't know what that is, except as I mean, it could it might as well be Pearl Harbor. Yeah, it's just as fresh for you and me as a, a week, you know, as if it were a week ago. That second plane going into that building, where it still obviously has the the nose is in the building, but it's a still a plane. Yeah. Um, there's one, my, my favorite is really the wrong word, but the, the image that keeps coming back that I see over and over again, that will be my candidate for COVID-19 is one in which there are a couple of EMTs wheeling a patient into a, a hospital somewhere in Queens. And it, it's, it just so much. It's a, the picture I'm looking at it on my other screen. It's yeah. you, you look I, through, you look through a window, because so the viewer is safe, and the guy's still alive, but he, the patient is still alive, but he's wrapped up like a mummy, and the EMT's doing heroic work, just being in the room with that guy. Mm -hmm. um, I have fasts and. You know, you just imagine that they've been up for three days doing their, doing their work. Anyway, fantasy documents are 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 image. I think I lost your question. Well, it was was you know you oh the the maps the nuclear it. targeting yeah yeah what these, would be a good one these what, graphics what, what, what and also it, that what the is, whole idea that we should that somehow th these kinds of things should be made visible that in putting the paper as if an average per I mean there's a lot of things right. happening here that that I'm going to yeah. read the New York Times and I'm going to say oh I like how they've got this visualized and so now yeah. I can make a rational decision about whether or not to go into the city today I mean that seems okay. to be the upshot of it we're visual we're visual now I mean the internet makes everything available all the time we want to look and see what I mean, we expect to look at uh, CCTV. Uh, you know, let, let me look at see what Grand Central Station looks like. What does Penn Station look like right now? It's probably a ton kind of thing. Um, uh, I I don't know. Maybe you're you're saying maybe we're over over relying on on the images. I'm saying that it's here and we do that. Mm -hmm. So let's see have look, what would make for a more meaningful image. Um, 
one that perhaps that show how how the, the virus is actually spread. So that would be more of a network map. It would be more of a network diagram. Maybe that would be of, have greater effect. Maybe that would get people to stay inside. Mm -hmm. um, We'd have to be doing contact tracing to have that map, I think. But but you're absolutely right. I mean, the absence of it is pretty to, telling, right? <laughs> you, you have to be. You have to have knowledge instead yeah. of just gut gut right. reactions. But there are other ways in realities um, with, with different images. So I have a, a broad question to finish with, um, and that is about research itself. And um, how do you think the kind of research that you've done is going to change now in this moment? I mean that in two ways. Do you think there are new, new topics on the agenda now? New topics came in with Katrina. Maybe there's new topics now. That's one way I want to think about it. But the other is actually about logistics. Like you and I are having this, con you and I have had a lot of conversations. This is the first time we've ever done it in a distant Zoom medium. Um, is yeah. it possible to do good social science in this, in this way? So I'm going to leave those two questions, take you to one or both if you want. Uh -huh. I'll take them both. Uh, there, there will be new things, new, new questions, new ways of posing old questions, just because of people who are more creative or differently creative than, than, than I am. And that uh, I'm, I'm getting on in my years. Uh, these events happen. And there, there are a lot of young people at uh, the Disaster Research Center at, at uh, Delaware or the Natural Hazard Center at Colorado or around, in, around the country. We don't really say we're producing disaster researchers. They're environmental sociologists because that's really where uh, disaster research properly belongs in the academy now. And so young people will They'll, they'll, they'll make up new questions, or maybe they'll bring new methods to, 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 new, to old questions in new ways that, that I don't foresee. Some types of social science foreseeable future are not gonna be easily done. I mean, stuff, it depends on the question that you're asking, the method that's most appropriate. But some of those questions and some of those methods involve face-to-face -face interaction, not six feet apart. Right. <laughs> not, I need to sit right in. I don't, maybe I don't need to shake hands. Right, right. Uh, maybe, that's, maybe that's an American thing. I don't know. We can, do, we can probably do without that, but can, we can't really for some kinds of research to do without being around people. Ethnography is impossible. I'm not, I shouldn't say that. How, how terrible is that? I was gonna say ethnography is impossible without being in, being in the room with people, but maybe it is. Maybe, maybe, new, maybe new people will find new ways to do it. Maybe I'm stuck in my old ways. In the meantime, I'm, it does it does put a fire under my fanny to finish my book on institutional warning. Mm. Disasters keep happening, and that gives me something to do on Wednesdays. What day is this? I think it's Wednesday. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. there's a question for you. Yeah. What, what difference does it Wednesday? make if it's Wednesday or Sunday or or any other day? Yeah. I'm going to start every interview from now on with "What day is it?" Just to <laughs> just to see see if they know. You have a title for the new project? Well, it seems like I'm warning you. <laughs> I'm warning you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's good. It's vaguely menacing. <laughs> right. 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 Yeah. Well, we'll I, want, I want to thank you for your, your time today and, and talking about the different books and the different concepts and, um, you're always a person that I come back to to try to kind of get a check on what I should be paying attention to in these moments, Lee. So thanks a million for all you've done. I'm flattered that you thought of me, Scott.
And I want to remind everybody we are on COVID calls every weekday at 5 p.m. And tomorrow we will be talking about COVID-19 and Cancer Alley. So we will talk to you then. Stay healthy, everybody. Thank you.